I want you to think about what this, what could this possibly mean when God begins to say, put off the old man and train up the new man. Yeah. Self-denial. Train up the new man. I got a message from our Marine guy. Y'all look at him, he's right there in the bay. And I said I wasn't going to read it in its entirety, but in the midst of this message, he begins to tell me that, you know, when we first go out, he sent me a video of the Marines and they get off the bus from being recruited and they put two feet on yellow footsteps, footprints, and they stand there. And that's the first step of knowing that you have made the transition. You have made it off of this bus. All on this bus, the people are yelling and screaming at you. I can't make out what's really going on because I've never been in that situation, but as I watch it, I begin to cry. But if you've ever been recruited, I just want you to come take a seat closer to the front so I can make sure I put my eyes on you. If you've ever been recruited, I know you can't, but the rest of you, if you've been recruited into any armed forces, I just want you to come a little closer. In his message, he said, you get one call when you make it. And you say this recruit has made it. I begin to think, even in the testimony this morning, of, of the things that are the people that we think are non-negotiables in our life. And I thought, God, if you gave me a chance to make one phone call to tell these people that I made it and I'm not coming back, that civilian lifestyle ain't for me no more. I've made it. I've come off these dots. I'm on this payphone. I'm not, I'm not coming back. This recruit has made it. I don't know if you as a believer have ever changed your name to just being a recruit, but this recruit, this recruit has made it. That's the call that parents get. He further told me that it don't matter if they answer the phone or not. And back then it was mostly landline. You better hope they had a voicemail so you can leave it. This recruit has made it and you will hear back from me with instructions at the end of this training. There's some people that didn't even know you crossed over as a believer because you're still out there pretending to be a civilian. Come on. There's some people that when you call them, you still pretend like you haven't been recruited into the army of God. And you wonder why life is still life in your life. There's some people that you are still surrounded by and I can't help but think about all the different branches and even how they keep them separate until it's time for battle. They train on different fields. They're stationed at different bases. But this recruit has made it into a place that there's no looking back. At least not for seven weeks or 14 weeks or 10 weeks. You won't be able to reach me. I want to ask you that if you're in your time of transition, if you ever took a moment to just be by yourself, if you ever took a moment to say that there is no more I but we. Because everything that I do from this day forward not only affects me, but it affects those connected to me. Come on. But this recruit has made it. The greatest recruit that I could ever see was Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, I want you to stand and turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to go straight to verse 62. Many of us know the story of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We know the story, but in this moment it says on the next day. I don't know how long that bus ride was. How long was it? Depended. 20 some hours. This, this starts out and it says the next day which followed the day of preparation. I don't know what the day before getting on them yellow footprints looked like, but I, be I believe that it was a lot of preparation. I believe that it was getting rid of a lot of the old stuff and putting on some new stuff. I believe that it was downsizing the things that you carried. I believe it looked a little bit like changing flights. I believe that the next day, which followed the day of preparation, I believe that, that that moment when they were preparing Christ, the day of preparation, 
the day of putting him in that tomb, the day of preparing him to be the one who was risen that day, the day that they thought that they would never see his face again, the day that they thought that his impression was gone, the day that your family thought that they lost you forever. That day of preparation when your family knew you were different, but they couldn't tell what was different about you. Come on, come on. The day of preparation when the enemy tried to destroy you. The day of preparation when they beat you down. The day of preparation when they put a crown on your head full of thorns. The day of preparation that didn't really feel like preparation at all. The day of anxiety. The day of worry, the day of pain, the day of trouble, the day of a long walk, the day of the beating, the day. The day that, that he prepared you to die to yourself. I want to talk about that day of preparation. And then it says, and the chiefs, priests, and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. Saying, sir. We remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said. After three days I will rise. I want you to know that they didn't believe him but they feared it. How many of you fear something that you don't even believe is true? They didn't even believe that he was the Messiah. They didn't even believe that somebody can rise in three days but they feared it. There's some people in your life that don't believe that you can be somebody different, but they fear you becoming somebody different. There's some people in your life that fear that you will change when they don't even believe that you will ever change. There's some people in your life that never believe that you would make it, but they fear if you ever do. I want, to, I want you to know how Christ-like we really are. I want you to know that that deceiver, your son, your daughter, your sister, your brother, they said that after he said, I remember clearly, I don't like him like that. I don't trust his judgment. I don't trust his word, but, but I remember when he said that I'm going to show you better than I can tell you. I remember when that man we killed yesterday, I remember when he said, that nothing is going to stop me. I don't know if that's you, but the next verse says these words. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. The thing that you don't believe, you still call deception, but you use it to get some truth. I begin to look at this and I begin to think about the, the people lapping like dogs on guard, standing and watching on guard. Standing and watching on guard. Drinking. Doing what they need to do. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about that moment in time where you told somebody, just give me some time. Give me about a week, I'm gonna come back. Give me three days, I'm gonna pay you back. Give me, give me this much time and I'm gonna do this. That's what Jesus said. But what we don't realize is that the moment that we put a time frame on what God is doing, that the enemy is going to guard us like never before. He's going to make sure that you don't come through on your promise. Because better the deception at the end be greater than the deception at the beginning. Oh, come on. I've already seen what this girl can do. They want me out of here because they know what I'm capable of. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. Come on. They want to put guards around me at least for three days. I want you to do it. I want you to tell your enemy, do it. Do it. Here's what the next verse says. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. Verse 66. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. I want you to know that no matter what they did, 
he still rose. You may be seated. So when I begin to look at this, train up the new man. For at least three days, at least the duration of the time that you thought you was going to be successful. The enemy was encamped all around you. Stand in guard. I want you to know that just as we stand guard, the enemy stands guard. I want you to understand that the same way that we watch, he's watching. So in that moment when he begins to say, I, at least three days, is what he said. At least three days, have your guard stand there. That way the deception in the beginning, in the end, is not worse than the one in the beginning. I don't care how long you stand guard. I don't care how much of my life you have robbed me of. I don't care what you have stolen from me. I don't care how you have beat me. I don't care how you cuss me out. Here's what begins to happen when we have this military mindset. Those of us who do not have a military mindset, you might show up to boot camp, and the first time somebody says something off the line to you, the first time your sergeant cusses at you, and you think you're bigger than him, you're ready to go home, and now you've thrown away everything that God told you to do because you didn't like how the guards handled you. I was looking at incarceration in prison all at one time. And some of us, we've been locked up this whole time, but we just ain't been incarcerated. You've been in bondage. You realize that there's no matter what, no matter how great you are, you have told the people too much. I told you that when I turn 21, I'm moving out, and I'm going to be the best version of me regardless of what you try to do to me. So 21 comes and you find out that your mother, your father, your grandmother, whoever raised you, has placed a barrier around your life that kind of makes you look stuck. It makes 21 look like it's impossible. But if you just wait to 21 in a day, come on. if you just wait until they grow weary of holding guard of you, if you just believe what God has already said, if you just believe that those three days that he promised you in the beginning are the same three days that you will receive at the end, if you just believe for just one minute, Jesus was buried in a tomb that was kept guard for three days. But he still had to make do on his promise. I want you to Look at 28, and it says, And after the Sabbath on the first day of the week began, the dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone of the door that sat on it. Sometimes we got to have those guards in place so that they know it was nobody but God. Not by my might. My might not right. My might, my might will make me push this door and you're going to think that I escaped and now you're going to kill me again because you're going to think I'm alive in the flesh. My might will have you tripping. My might will make you think that I am the redeemer. My might will make you think that I did this all by myself. But it's not until that moment when there's no life in your body and there's no way for you to roll back a tomb that God begins to come and push the tombs out of your way. And people can see, no matter who's standing guard on your life, trying to hold you in a box, when you get off of that boat, yeah. when you get out of that ship, yeah. when you step out of that car, yeah. whatever has had you boxed in, when you come out of it, the guards that try to keep you will see you. They're going to know how much strength they put in to destroy you. The recruiters... They know what they did to destroy you. They know how they made you feel. Us believers, God places us in situations with believers that will destroy us. People who are trying, we are trying to be where they are. I come in as a recruit. I want to be a recruiter, but I don't like the recruiter that I see. But this recruiter is going to make me become the person that I want to be. This is what it looks like when we're in the church. I don't like what I see, but in this place, I become who I want to be. I don't believe that boot camp was a pleasant place, but what I do believe is that those who made it through came out better than what they were when they went in. I 
see as believers that Christ, he might not have liked the way that he went in, but because he came back out, he's now a part of each and every one of us. The impression is greater when you take the beating. The impression is greater when somebody takes guard on your life and you know it was nothing but God that brought you through it. This recruit, this recruit has made it. When I call back home, I don't sound the same. When I show up, I don't look the same. I don't need a tattoo to show you who I am. I want you to understand that Christ wasn't even there and they knew he had risen. Not because they saw him, but because they believed in him. You don't have to see me, but believe me when I tell you. You might not think I made it, but believe me when I tell you. With those of little faith, I'm going to open up my hands and show you. And that's what Christ did. I'm going to open up my hands and show you that the piercings are still there, but I'm healed. I don't remember what the percentage was, but it was like 80% of those who get recruited actually make it. Maybe less. I don't remember. But we expect everybody that walks through the doors of the church to make it. To be recruited into the army of God, it requires some things. To be a military-minded believer, it's going to require some things. You might get yelled at. You might get fussed at. You might get kicked. You might get spit on. There are some things that you might have to endure that you never had to endure as a civilian. But what I found out is that when they go into this line of recruit, they train them to be soldiers. They train them to be Marines. They train them to be sailors. When they get out, they never train them to be a civilian again. When you're out of the military, nobody coaches you on how to have a civilian mindset again. They throw you out there and they expect you to just swim. When you're incarcerated, Nobody coaches you how to go back out and be a civilian again. I begin to think about how many times we come into this world of belief. And when it doesn't suit us anymore, we try to just go back out there. The new song says, they not like us. They not like us. So they'll let you mix and mingle as long as you want to. But those that you mingle with that have not come into Christ, they know you not like them. They're not just going to let you sit as long as you think that you are. They're not going to be your friend as long as you think they are. Eventually, if you stay with me long enough, you find out that I've in fact been called. If you sit around me long enough, I start to make you uncomfortable. If you sit in my presence long enough, you find out that you don't want to invite me to that place no more. Because this recruit was never trained to be a civilian again. When I made those calls and I let my exes know that this, this is over. This recruit has crossed over. Whether I ever heard from them again, didn't matter or not. There were some people that I had to pick up the phone and have the conversation with. That my life is different. The conversation didn't feel good. It hurt. The love didn't change. But my heart posture did. My position did. My calling did. When they go into the military, because that's what God compares us to, soldiers, armed forces, when you go in, there's some phone calls that you just got to make. And that part of self-denial and that part of crossing over, there's some phone calls that you will make. There'll be some people that are not there when you get back home. There'll be some grandparents that may have passed away and you could not attend their service. There'll be some things, some birthday parties that you just had to miss. I don't know who gave us the handout that being a Christian was easy or fun, but it is lonely and it is hard. 
when you walk this life, when you place your feet where God has told you to place your feet, and you have to call the necessary people to tell them that you, you've been recruited, it's not going to feel good. The people that you will face for the next few days, they won't treat you like family. They're going to strip you of everything you once knew. They're going to change your name. They're going to make you ask to go to the bathroom. They treat you like you are lower than everything in that room because they want you to be humble. If you are a believer and God has ever stripped you of some things and made you humble, I just want you to stand up. As a believer, if you've ever been humble, if your conviction felt more like condemnation, if you thought that even when you made it, God, at this point, in three days, I'm going to rise. I'm going to get back up. But the guards were so close to you that you couldn't move. The enemy was encamped so close around you that you couldn't escape his wrath. And all you can do is wait on God. If you've ever had to be humble, then I'm going to say that you've been recruited. The next step is to make the necessary phone calls. Have those tough conversations. Because I found that I grieve my past longer when I associate with it. I stand in the room with my past. I associate with my past, and it doesn't make it easier. But I feel like those who have been recruited when they're driven 24 hours away from where they come from, and they're locked into a camp with no way to communicate with nobody for 10 weeks, and they eat what they're told to eat, they're going to call you religious. They're going to say you in a cult. When you start eating what they tell you to eat, they've never called the military people religious. They've never called the military a cult. But if you join in the army of God, there's going to be slander. They're going to have names for you. So you got to make sure that's where you want to be. you got to make sure that whatever forces you join in on, you're willing to defend with your honor, with respect. You're willing to read the decree over your life. And David, if you can pull up that decree for the Marine, it's a simple message. It's simple. They take their weapon, they take their rifle. But David said, if the rifle is the Bible, then what does the message sound like? The Marines read this. This is my rifle. Every time it's rifle, I'm gonna replace it with Bible. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. My Bible is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it I'm, as I master my life. My Bible without me is useless. And without my Bible, I am useless. I must fire my Bible true. I must shoot straight than my enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. My Bible and myself know what counts as war is not the rounds that we fire or the noises that we burst nor the smoke that we make. We know that it is in the hits that count and we will hit. My Bible is human even as I because it is my life. Thus, I will learn it as my brother. I will learn its weaknesses, its strengths, its parts, its accessories, its sights, and its barrel. I will ever guard it against the ravages of the weather that damage it. I will ever guard as I guard my legs, my arms, my eyes, and my heart against damage. I will keep my Bible clean and ready. I will become part, we will become part of each other. We will, before God, I swear this creed that my Bible and myself are the defenders of my country. 
We are the masters of our enemies and we are the saviors of our lives. It's going to take the believers to take their Bible as a rifle to defend the country that we are about to walk into. It's going to take believers in the army of God to be able to make it through this next election. It's going to take us submitting ourselves just as it says in Jeremiah, taking up the yoke of bondage, being detained, following the rules of our enemies in order to see the victory. No, your recruiter might not be nice. No, the drill sergeant may not speak to you in love. No, it might not go as you thought it was. No, the trip might not be easy. But I will obey because I want to make it. I will obey because I'm trying to make it into a force that I dreamed of my whole life. I will make it because I want to stand side by side with the God who told me that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But I got to learn this thing. Not only is strength, but the weaknesses of the word as well. So if that's you, if you're saying, God, I have my Bible. I have it dear to my heart. I will learn it like I know my brother. I will guard it like it's my own body part. Because without me, it's useless. And me without it is useless. I will use it to not only defend myself, but to defend my country. We got to live here. The enemy is guarding us all around. Whether it be with a sickness or a gun or a loss of a job. He's trying to place a guard around us to keep us locked in this tomb of death. But the just shall live by faith. So most gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, oh God that you have called us recruits. Father, you can change our names. You can change our dynamics. Father, cleanse us, watch us, and make us whole. I thank you, O oh God, that you have given us a weapon of warfare, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of this dark world. I thank you, O oh God, that we will not only see the people, oh, the person, that we will not see the person, but we will see the principality, that we will know, O oh God, exactly where you have recruited us to. That we will know exactly what kind of enemies that we have to fight in our life. In the lanes that you have placed us in. I thank you, oh God, for the land battles, for the sea battles, oh God. I thank you, oh God, for every battle that you place us in that it is already victorious. And I ask you, oh God, that when the enemy wins, that when you give us over into the enemy's hands, Father, that you keep us humble and faithful, that you will bring us out. I don't know if you know it, but the Bible says that I will deliver you into the hands of Babylon. I will deliver you into the hands of your enemy. But I will give you victory if you take up the yoke. If you just, just for a little while, submit to the evil leaders so that they can see that my people have a sense of unity, that my people know how to follow directions, then I will, I will deliver you. I have to know the Bible's strengths and its weaknesses. Some of us, when we have been given over to the enemy, we started to give the enemy credit. That's God. Because what Nebuchadnezzar begins to learn in the midst of that is how to love God. Because you captured someone who loves him just enough. When the enemy captures you, I want you to be so Christ-like that they find Jesus by holding you as a prisoner. That they find Jesus by holding you in captivity. When you come out, I want them to come out too. Amen. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for this word. I thank you, oh God, for your supernatural deliverances. I thank you, Father, that you will allow us to be keen and speak what it is that you have called us to speak and operate the way that you have called us to operate. Father, I thank you that you allow us to be recruited into your army. And we just ask, oh God, that we make it. 
Allow us, Father, to make it. Allow us to follow every rule, every protocol, to not be weak, to not grow faint in our well-doing. Allow us, Father, our strength, physical strength, mental strength, oh God, against the anguish, against the enemy. I remember reading, and I'm going to let y'all go. I remember reading when I was reading about all of this. You may be seated. That in the midst of of the recruit, they're not supposed to put their hands on you. The drill sergeants, they're not supposed to touch you. They're not supposed to cause you any harm. This is, and this is literally how it was written in Google, USA, whatever. They're not supposed to. <laughs> that don't mean they won't. If you were raised as a believer like I was, they usually told us that the enemy can't touch you. Don't be afraid because he can't touch you. He can only do so much. He's not supposed to. The drill sergeant is not supposed to put their hands on you. But they cannot say that nobody has ever died at the hands of the drill sergeant. The drill sergeant is not supposed to cause any bodily harm. But they cannot say that some people have not made it to the line because of the bodily harm in boot camp. It's not supposed to happen, but it might. So when I say you need to know the strengths and the weaknesses of the gospel, you have to know that the things, some things are said that they won't happen, but somewhere else you will see that they might happen. God, you said you would never leave me nor forsake me, but he dropped some people off in the wilderness. It ain't supposed to happen, but it might. <coughs> the question is, is how are you going to respond? You made it to week 10. You got four weeks to go. But now the enemy is attacking your finances and you give up. You made it to week seven and you got three weeks to go. But now the enemy that took your child, so you give up. You made it. You had one more day. It was the day after preparation that your victory really came. I don't know what it's going to look like for you when you deny yourself and you make it known that you have been recruited. I don't know who you're gonna lose. I don't know what losses and finances will cost. I don't know the damage. But what I do know is that it's necessary to move forward. It's a backpack experience. You can take whatever you want there, but you might not have it when you get there. The things that you liked when you went in, you might not like coming out. Next week is going to be a different story. Because now you know the requirements. I showed up at this recruiting office, overweight, visible tattoos, scarring, medical problems. They gave me the list of everything that needed to be corrected if I wanted to be here. I'm preaching holiness. If my tattoo is hidden, fine. But if it's on my face, you're going to have to get rid of that. A lot of us, we don't want, we don't want to get rid of the things that we can see. Your image is the very reason that you have not been recruited. So I don't know who told you that you can do what you want, wear what you want, be who you want, and be recruited into the army of Christ, but it don't, it don't work like that. Holiness. Come as you are to the recruiting office. But when I list out these requirements that this is really where you want to be, you're going to have to suit up and get ready to ship. 
You can't carry all that weight with you. They ask you, do you have children? Yes. Do these children got somebody you can sign them over to? Because even that can't go with you. When you are recruited into the army of Christ, that list, I'm not even looking at the Bible, even if you're not a believer, just military minded. The list of things that you gotta just make sure are taken care of. So you wanna still be a civilian? Have you ever been prosecuted? Have you ever been charged with a felony? Have you ever had a CPS case? You know all the questions they ask on the application? So no, nobody here is physically doing that to you but God. He wants you to clean all that up. I want you to clean it up. The military used to have this thing, don't ask, don't tell. I'm not asking, but if you start telling, then you gotta fix it. You know, we don't walk in and say, hey, if you ever killed somebody, if you can, go sit on that side. Have you ever lied? If you have, go sit on that side. Don't ask, don't tell. You sit in your own sin. But the moment that it's exposed, that's my problem. I got to change me to be a recruit. You got to change you to be a recruit. There's some holiness requirements in the army of God. And I'm not saying I'm kicking you out. Because in boot camp, all of these things can be worked out. But you got to be willing. The physicalities, every infirmity, every sickness, every visible scarring and tattoo, that got to be taken care of by you. That's your responsibility. The rest of this, we can get out of you in boot camp. So if you believe in that for yourself, if you believe in God, I, I want to be righteous. I want to live a holy life. Then I just want you to suit up. He's not mad at you, but he has requirements. And it's no longer enough to just say, this is who I am. I'm too late for too old to change. If I could still wear mesh tops with a bra underneath, I would. I can't. That's all I had. I can't do that. If I could still wear black lipstick, I would, but I can't. If I could still walk in here with my girl on my arm, I would, but I can't. I don't know if you guys understand the depths of change that are required to be who God has called you to be, but I hope that you're willing. Because at this point, there ain't no more Job experiences. You are responsible for making it into the army. The battle's in it, that's God. So Father, we just thank you for this word. We thank you, God, for this wisdom. We thank you, oh God, even for the guards that stand on our post. For those who help us fight battles, oh God, and for those who have locked us in. So that we would know, Father, that it was you, your perfect timing, your might, your, your power that brought us through. I thank you, oh God, that we will not be distracted by those that we love. But, Father, that we can see your face. We decree and declare over our lives, oh God, that this recruit has made it. And, Father, we just ask that you just begin to have your way in our lives. Wash us, cleanse us, purify us, and make us whole. I thank you, oh God, that you will be with them in this week. In this month, oh God, with every phone call that they have to make, with every tough conversation they have to have, with everything that they have to get in order, with everything that they have to release and everything that they have to pick up, I thank you, God, that you're even getting their health in order so that they can be ready for battle. Father, let every sickness and infirmity, oh God, that tries to keep them from being in the army of God be uprooted now in Jesus' name. I thank you, oh God, that no matter how evil our leaders may be. Father, that you have called them for such a time as this. And I ask you, oh God, that you allow us as believers to believe in you and to submit to them, that you may have free will in the lives of all of those who serve you. I thank you, oh God, that though weapons will be formed, that they will not prosper. And we decree and declare, oh God, that there be no backlash and no retaliation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.
Corps team, if you can come forward. I know that they're serving. If you do not have time to come in your giving, we ask that you come in your giving. If you need to drop off a, a if you need to speak to a recruiting officer, I don't know if we got any yet. Don't come to me, I ain't ready. I'm scared. But if you need to speak to, and that's what I'm gonna call it in this season, just a recruiting officer. Another believer, somebody who can maybe encourage you to get you on the right path, to figure out what it is that you're still missing. We just want you to come to the altar. Because we want you to know it's not too late and it won't happen overnight. All military people, if you can come forward. If you've ever been in the military. I want y'all to face the congregation. Make room for the people to come. But just in this moment, in this moment, if you, if, if you just need prayer or anything, the prayer team is going to come up, but I just want you to just begin to, to think about what the people standing before you had to give up. And I also want you to just think for a minute about what their, their mindsets might look like right now. I don't know how many of them went to war. I don't know what they seen, what they had to battle with. I don't know who their drill sergeants were. But in this moment, I'm asking that God just begins to touch our minds and our hearts. That if he makes us 